I'm going to gloss over a bunch of references. If you want them, talk to me afterwards, or I'll post them up on the web page um, here. Uh, so <laughs> let me just start out um, the story. Um, a physicist, a chemist, and a sociologist were called into the dean's office. And as they arrived, the dean is suddenly called away on an emergency, leaving the three professors sitting there in his office. And uh, the professors are alarmed to see there's a fire in his wastebasket. And the physicist says, oh, I know what to do, I know what to do. If we cool down the uh, materials until uh, they go, the temperature is lower than the ignition temperature, the fire will go out. Um, and the chemist says, no, no, I know what to do, I know what to do. We need to cut off the supply of oxygen. And one of the, when one of the reactants is gone, then the chemical reaction will stop and the fire will go out. And they're arguing about what they're supposed to do. And then they're alarmed to see the sociologist is going around the room lighting fires. Um, and they scream at him, what are you doing? And he says, I'm trying to create a large enough sample. <laughs> so, so this is the sample size question, an adequate sample. And what is an adequate sample? And um, just by way of sort of introduction, let me say the reason this issue is important is that there's a hierarchy of um, research designs in terms of the strengths of your ability to make inferences. And um, as part of that hierarchy, strong refers to the ability to, uh, out, to rule out alternative explanations for your, um, for your data, uh, for your results. And sampling turns out to be a very powerful way to rule out alternative explanations. So that's why this is a critical issue. So I'm going to start here. Um, well, OK. So the issue then is drawing a, the right sample is sort of a proper sample, and you have to follow certain rules. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about those rules as a sort of a quick uh, introduction here. Um, some of, most of you will already know this, so this is just a very quick uh, explanation. Um, our goal here in sampling is to make statements about a group of people or other objects, web pages, tweeter, tw tweets, whatever, which we'll call the population. For time and cost reasons, we can't collect data on everyone. You know, the 2010 U.S. Census collected seven pieces of information on the 300 million plus people in the U.S. and it cost $10 billion um, and took years of planning. So you can't do that very often, um, although we'll talk about that in the context of social media in a moment. The solution is collect, select a subset. Um, and it turns out in many cases it's not necessary to collect data on everyone in the population. Um, the key is, um, how then do you know that the results from the subset are the same as the results if you had actually collected all the data from the population? And the answer, which took statisticians some 50 years to work out, is this right here. You draw the sample so every person in the population has an equal probability of selection. Um, that turns out actually simple to say, often very difficult to do, particularly in the context of social media. Um, so a quick uh, step set of simplified steps here for creating a sample. Um, you construct a sampling frame, you draw the sample, and you collect the data. And for social media collection, it's often these two are pretty much simultaneous. Um, the sampling frame is a critical issue here. Um, this is basically a list of every object in your population of interest, whether that's people, network edges, uh, plants, animals, um, web pages, whatever it is you're interested in. This is a really big deal, and this is no joke, because this is expensive, this is often time consuming, and if you can't construct a sampling frame, you often can't do the study. Um, there often is no alternative. Um, sampling frames are also often biased in a variety of ways. Um, so it's very, very important. Um, on the internet, there are a series of fairly specialized sampling frame issues, and I'm glossing over very large, whole books at this point, <laughs> jumping to the internet. Um, and as I said, I'll give you references if you're interested. Um, so for example, on the internet, it's often impossible to find any sort of reasonable sampling frame. Um, you can try to figure out a way to sample all blogs or sample all web pages, and the answer is there's just no way to do it. Um, so no one has a representative sample of blogs. No one has, even of political blogs, no one has a representative sample. 
of these kinds of subsets of interest, no one has a representative sample of web pages because it's impossible to create a sampling frame. Um, let me just point out, there are people who have done attempts to sample blogs or, so for example, political blogs. What happens under those circumstances is people find the blogs that are most visible. So the bias there is always towards the big visible blogs that attract a lot of attention. That is not, they do not get the whole population and the part of the population they miss are the people who are writing about politics but they don't have a large audience. Um, you know, they're writing for friends or something like that. So the result of that is that almost all studies on the internet are biased in various ways. The direction and the extent of the bias are unknown um, and usually undiscoverable. Um, now there are some exceptions where you can construct a proper sampling frame and there are a couple the key one is if you want to sample an organization where you have a comprehensive membership list or where there is universal access to email or the internet. So if you want to sample um, a university, you can probably do that. You can probably get a good sample of students. You could get a good sample of a corporation. You can get a good sample of a government department. Um, you know, those sorts of places it's possible, but that only works because they have a, a complete membership list of some kind from which you can draw your um, sample. Now interestingly, MySpace assigned its, assigns its membership numbers sequentially. Um, so if you know what the current highest membership number is, um, you can get a random sample of members of MySpace because you just start at one and work up to whatever the current number is. Um, so this is, one of the, this is one of the very, very few cases in social media where you can actually do a random, yes. And importantly, they have a small enough membership space that you can actually yes. search it randomly because you get others where it say it's a 64-bit unique right. identifier and it, it's too big of a sample space to search. Right. It, too much of it's unpopulated. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think these are not just, but they're sequential too. Okay. That's what makes it small, okay. <laughs> particularly. Um, there are some ways to do, there's some techniques, a paper by Joka um, in 2010 describes a random walk technique for sampling Facebook, um, which may actually turn out to be uh, useful. Um, as far as I know, no one else is using that other than him, and it's somewhat controversial, um, but it's an interesting way of sampling, uh, creating a true random sample where you have no sampling frame. Um, and there are other uh, situations where you can sample where you have no sampling frame as well. You have to take advantage of the peculiar characteristics of the situation. Um, one of the situations that the internet does, that the internet makes possible, is dealing with rare events. Rare events are always difficult to handle in sampling. Uh, a rare event is, for example, uh, sampling illegal immigrants, um, because how are you going to find them? <laughs> Uh, sampling gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual people, I and mean, they're hard to find. You don't. So um, you know there are all sorts of studies of children where they wanted children between the ages of one and three, and so how do you find households with children between the ages of one and three? I mean, this is the the solution. Often has been you create a go to a huge data set and you find some small subset, um, and it's extremely expensive. One of the interesting examples here is a study that Duncan Watts was associated with um, on information diffusion. One of the problems with studies of diffusion is they're all biased towards success. I mean, what you hear about is the successful studies of things that have diffused off to millions of people and are very visible. Um, you know, you do studies of things like uh, technology diffusion, of successful technology diffusion successful, but you, not, you don't know anything about the um, lack of the ones that aren't successful. Um, and what they did was they wanted examples of objects that went viral, as they said, um, that started to diffuse very widely and very rapidly from a single source. Um, they studied six projects, and what they found strikingly was almost nothing diffuses. Something like 90% of all of the attempts to diffuse something completely failed. They never diffused beyond the individual who originally, who originated it. Another 5% diffused only to one person. Um, and so what they ended up having to do in order to find viral events, 
Um, they sampled millions and several million events in order to get a thousand um, viral events. Um, it's an interesting example of a case where the internet actually worked well um, in sampling this kind of rare event. Um, so with those couple of examples, let me turn to some advantages of using the internet here. Um, and the biggest advantage, of course, is uh, any work on the internet tends to be quite cheap. You get fast turnaround. Um, you know, server space is cheap. Um, connections are cheap. Uh, at universities, particularly, we have access to high-speed connections readily. Um, you get fast turnaround. The data are already in electronic form. You can often transform them into a form useful for analysis without ever having to touch them by human hands. So it all just works automated in an automated way. You can often produce daily results um, in a continuous stream. Now, if you're sampling people through social media and you want to do something like send them a questionnaire or have them answer some questions, you have some advantages. You have no interviewer effects because you have no interviewer. So you're not going to have biases because the interviewer, some interviewers may be giving certain signals and others are not. You can have um, a great deal of control over the sequence of questions. You can put in complex skip patterns and things like that. Um, they're very complex questionnaires are possible. You have fewer social desirability effects. Now that issue, of course, since people are answering in private, <laughs> Um, you know, they're not going, the assumption is there are fewer social desirability effects. That actually turns out to be somewhat um, controversial at the moment, and even though um, I would still maintain it. Anyway, and finally, you can ask knowledge questions, you can ask questions like income and things like that. People can th consult their records. You know, if it takes them five or ten minutes, you don't really care. The computer's just sitting there. There's no cost to that, and that's very different than if an interviewer is sitting there or if you're on the phone or something like that. Um, if you're sampling social media directly and you want to sample things like web pages or blogs or tweets or something like that, you have other advantages. They're unobtrusive. This is a big deal. You're, you're not, people don't know they're being observed, so their behavior is not being changed by the fact they're under observation. If you're sampling, for example, tweets, um, be a good example of unobtrusive uh, behavior. You're observing actual behavior. You're not observing self-reported behavior. You're reporting what people actually are, what they actually do. Um, you can get very large samples very quickly at low cost. Um, millions are possible. Um, and that allows analysis of subgroups very easily. Um, and finally, you can get data on an entire population. You're not depending on a sample. And even a very large population can be assembled into a data set. Now, along with those advantages, of, there come a number of disadvantages. If you're sampling people through social media, uh, the first case, a lot of people have no or limited internet access, which creates a sampling frame problem. Um, that means you are limited immediately in what you're able to generalize. You can only generalize to people who use the internet. Um, and in Britain, that leaves out about 25% of the population. In the U.S., that leaves out about 35% of the population. So you're not going to be able to say anything about those people who are off the Internet. Um, you'll often get an extremely poor response rate. Um, it's very easy to ignore an email request or a Facebook request or a tweeted request. Um, and so response rates uh, in single digits um, are in fact typical, um, and some are very, very low. Um, in fact, 1% is, is, is not unknown. Um, I should add the solution to this, by the way, is a mixed mode study where you, some people receive an internet questionnaire and some people receive a, uh, a paper questionnaire or a phone. Um, that has its own problems that I won't go into, but that's actually an active area of research, as you can imagine, because a lot of people are very, very interested in that. Um, who answers the uh, who answers on the social on the social media is uncontrolled. I mean, you may email it to a particular person, but that doesn't mean they're the person who answer it. It could be their spouse or partner answered. It could be their son answered, their daughter answered, their nephew. I mean, you have no idea. Some house guest 
might have, um, you know, said, I got this really cool questionnaire. Why don't you answer it? You might be interested. Um, yeah, I mean, who knows? Yeah, the dog might be answering. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, um, you need a lot of motivation and instruction. Since uh, the only thing they see is the questionnaire, the questions have to be right, the instructions have to be right, they have to be clear to absolutely everyone in your sample um, because there's nothing else. Um, so there's a lot of motivation and instruction needed that you would not need if there was actually an interviewer sitting across from them. Um, and finally, it's very difficult to get reliable responses for knowledge questions. Because if you start asking people, well, do you know how to uh, conduct a search for a certain term, if they may not know it, they might easily, or you might ask, how do you conduct a search for a particular term? and give them four alternatives, they could ask their partner or they could ask someone else in the household, how do you do that, and they'll get the right answer. So you can't really get reliable answers that way. Um, if you're sampling social media directly, well, okay, you may have the entire population, but what, but what is it a population of? Um, that's a question. Um, you often don't know much about the characteristics of the population. Um, or anything else about it. Um, and even if you know something about them, it may turn out not to be a population of interest to many people. Um, so, for example, the 30% of the British population that uses Twitter um, has certain unusual characteristics. Um, and uh, that may be or may not be valuable. Uh, they're certainly not representative of the British population as a whole. Um, so uh, even if you have the entire population of Twitter users, it's hard to know what exactly you're predicting. Um, you know, you may know, you may have a great deal, uh, many cases, but you don't know much about each individual case. You're missing all sorts of basic demographic information like age, gender, education, income, marital status, occupation, um, et cetera. All sorts of basic information that identify the social position of people, um, is usually missing, um, and that means it's very hard to understand, uh, that may make it hard to understand the results. The meaning of, your of the behavior you're observing uh, may be uh, unclear. Um, you can't talk to the participants directly, probably in most cases. So a, case, a commercial site like Amazon can simply assume that everyone is coming there to buy something. Because if you're not coming there to buy something, like me, I'm usually looking up an ISBN or something, um, it doesn't really matter because they don't care anyway about me. <laughs> they only care about people who are motivated to buy. So the meaning of Amazon shopping on Amazon is clear. That's not a problem for them. But if you're a social scientist and you're interested in more complex questions other than commercial <laughs> meaning, um, it becomes really important why someone has tweeted, has retweeted something. Have they retweeted it because they thought it was, you know, really spot on? Have they retweeted it because it's the most ridiculous thing they've ever seen? Um, have they retweeted it, you know, because they knew the other person would be interested? Have they retweeted it because they knew the other person should be interested even if they know they're not? Um, you know, as a parent, I do that a lot. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, you have all sorts of possible motivations and it's very hard to know what the meaning of the behavior is. And finally, um, attitudes are a major influence on all kinds of uh, technology use and um, things like that. Um, they're almost always statistically significant in the multivariate models we run, um, but you're not going to know much about attitudes of people in social media if you're sampling social media. So that's sampling in populations. Thank you. And I'll um, throw the floor open here to questions and comments.